Good morning, everyone. Um, so yesterday we kind of left off. We didn't talk about this slide here. We didn't talk about phase diagrams so much. Um, we did. We did talk about this one where we have um, the heating curve of water, right? And as we move to the right, we melt things or freeze things, or we vaporize things or condense things because we have heat added on the x-axis here. And uh, we also have temperature on the y-axis. And when we look at our phase diagram, we also see that we have temperature on this diagram, uh, but this time it's on the, it's on the x-axis. And we have pressure in ATM, which is atmospheres. So we have pressure on the y-axis. And 1.00 atmospheres is, as you might be able to guess, the pressure of the entire atmosphere at sea level. Um, so it's the one atmosphere of pressure. Um, and when we look at this, this is the phase diagram for water. Um, so where this line from the pressure uh, from sea level atmospheric pressure, where that intersects this line here, uh, the boundary between the solid and the liquid phase, we have the normal freezing point of water. And over here where it intersects this boundary line between the liquid phase and the vapor phase, we have the normal boiling point of water. All right. So as we cross over this, this boundary area here, um, we evaporate or we condense, depending on which direction we're going. Um, and as we move across up here, in between the solid and liquid phases, we of course melt or freeze. We melt and freeze. This thing here, the triple point right here, what this thing says is that this is the point at which all three of these phases exist in equilibrium. Okay, and down below the triple point, um, we have, we can uh, sublimate from a solid to a vapor, or we can have deposition from the vapor to the solid, depending on how, uh, whether we change the temperature or the pressure. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Up here we have the critical point, critical point, and that's a temperature, very high temperature and very high pressure at which point um, we, we can get what's called a supercritical fluid. Um, and that's, it's a, it's a, like a phase that has uh, fluid, fluid properties, um, but it's, um, it's where the vapor and the liquid um, exist in um, equilibrium and it's it's reversible you can just lower the pressure um, or you can you can lower the, the temperature and keep the pressure high and it'll change to a liquid liquid and yeah it's it's totally reversible anyway if you want if you want a good um, example of the critical point or the the supercritical fluid um, I would recommend looking up Nile Red's excellent video in which he um, he makes, he makes aerogel, uh, look up Nile Red's aerogel video. Um, he builds a, a, an apparatus, uh, to make supercritical CO2. Um, and he actually has, he has video footage of it. It's really kind of fun to watch. It's neat. Um, anyway, this is a triple point plot. As I mentioned, uh, across that line, across that boundary line, we melt in the one direction and freeze in the other direction vaporize and condense between the liquid and gas phase and sublimate or deposit uh, from the solid to the gas or the gas to the solid. And another diagram. Here uh, we have the supercritical fluid area lined out. All right, critical temperature, critical pressure is the critical point. So we haven't really talked, we've talked about temperature, but we haven't really said what it is. I mean, we kind of have, 
but we kind of haven't. So let's talk about this more. So um, in order to keep things from just being subjective, we have to come up with scales of temperature. And there are three such scales that are fairly common and that we'll hear about and deal with um, in no particular order, um, certainly not in order of importance, um, because, okay, so the Fahrenheit scale is only used by one country in the world. There is only one country in the world that even has this as a thing that exists, and that's the United States. Only the United States uses Fahrenheit units. Um, nobody else uses that temperature scale. It's, it's Celsius everywhere else in the world, except in some labs where the scientists want to deal with temperature in terms of absolutes, and then they, they switch to Kelvin. Um, but the Fahrenheit scale, Fahrenheit scale was made by this guy, Daniel Fahrenheit, he named it after himself. He, he was alive in, uh, you know, kind of the latter part of the 17th century, in the 1600s, um, back before, you know, refrigeration was a thing. They were still discovering things like temperature scales. Um, so he made this scale um, and he set the zero point as the coldest thing he could make in his lab, which was liquid, uh, it was, it was an ice and water bath. And he said that is zero Fahrenheit. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The story I have is that he then set 100 degrees as being the uh, human body temperature. And he kind of divided everything up between that. Uh, but this scale points out that there are 180 Fahrenheit degrees between the freezing point of water and the boiling point of water. Um, but he needed to find the freezing point and just having zero, like he needed a temperature unit. Um, anyway, it's a silly scale and it doesn't make sense. It's silly and it doesn't make sense. Um, but everyone was coming up with scales at the time, and that one happened to stick for some values of sticking. Um, a much, much better scale, one that makes more sense, is the Celsius scale. The Celsius scale sets zero degrees as the freezing point of water. It makes sense, right? It's easy. It's, 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 so zero C is the freezing point of water. And then it orients itself around properties of water. And the boiling point of water is then 100 degrees C. So there are 100 Celsius degrees between the freezing point and boiling point of water. Makes it nice and simple, easy, easy units that are, yeah. All right. And then, uh, but some scientists came along and they were like, well, I mean, if we want to talk about heat and like how much heat is in a thing, like what we're really talking about is molecular motion and they weren't satisfied with the zero point of the Celsius scale. They were okay with the units. They're like, we'll use that unit size, um, but we want to set zero as an absolute. So we want to come up with a, an absolute zero at which point all molecular motion has stopped. And they did that, and they came up with the Kelvin scale. And at zero Kelvin, there's no heat left in the thing. Zero Kelvin means there is no more molecular motion. No more. Um, and as I may have mentioned at some point, um, we've, we, we've gotten to like the millikelvin range. Um, we've gotten to like very, very close to zero Kelvin. I don't know that we've ever actually made it to absolute zero, though I could be wrong. I'm not 100% up on modern physics. Um, interestingly, the coldest place on Earth sustained um, is up on Mauna Kea. Um, the detector for one of the one of the observatories, um, there's, there's a detector up there that uses helium-3 um, as a cooling agent, 
and helium-3 liquefies at a temperature in the fractions of a Kelvin. It's in the like hundredths to thousandths of a Kelvin, millikelvin range. Um, and yeah, so units of Kelvin are the same as the units of Celsius. So um, 100 Kelvins is the same as 100 degrees Celsius. I do want to point out, however, that Kelvin doesn't use the degree sign. So zero Kelvin is just zero Kelvin. It's not zero degrees Kelvin, it's just zero Kelvin. All right. If we want to compare Celsius, Celsius to Fahrenheit, because like for, you know, we're trying to communicate with anyone else in the world about what kind of temperature it is, you have to do this like fancy apparatus where Fahrenheit minus 32 degrees is equal to 1.8 degrees Celsius. So every um, what is that? Like every degree Fahrenheit, it's like every 1 over 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit is a degree Celsius. Every degree Celsius is 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the one. Um, but then like you have to orient it back to zero by subtracting 32. Um, the takeaway message here, for me at least, is that both of these scales are the same temperature at minus 40. Minus 40. I'm just going to stop my video for a moment. There it is. Hang on, let me, where is... For the, for the video, for the video, oh, I don't have it. Oh, never mind. Where's my, where's my, no, never mind, it's too much hassle. Um, <clears throat> I grew up, of course, in town where it regularly gets to minus 40. <sighs> so I always, I knew growing up that that was, anyway. Um, as I mentioned, no one uses Fahrenheit. Everyone else uses Celsius or Kelvin. If we want to convert 70 degrees Celsius to Kelvin units, all we do is we add 273 degrees Kelvin because as it turns out, the freezing point of water is 273 units of temperature above absolute zero. So if we take Celsius and we add 273, then we end up with Kelvin units. Simple, easy, sensible. And the reason we do this is because temperature can be subjective, and so fixed scales had to be introduced. Um, we like using the boiling point and freezing point of water because they are properties that can be eas like pretty consistently replicated. Um, the Celsius scale divides the range from freezing to boiling into 100 divisions. Originally, this is interesting, freezing was at 100 and boiling was zero. Um, but like, I, like, I read that, I, this is, this is kind of new to me. I read that and I, I can't understand why they would do it that way. It might have something to do with heat transfer, but like, it doesn't just naturally jump out to me why that would be the, it, it was, it made no sense to me. But today, freezing is at 0 C and boiling is at 100 C. So if somebody can, if, if anyone can, if somebody can explain that to me, why freezing would be at 100 and boiling would be at 0, like, if you can explain what they were thinking, let me know. We talked about the Fahrenheit scale. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Um, I'm not going to make you convert from Fahrenheit to Celsius or the other way because nobody cares about Fahrenheit. Um, if I'll, I'll add a, I'll add a, but if, uh, so I might, but only if only, only at minus 40, only at minus 40, do it at minus 40, convert at minus 40, but probably not even then. Um, and we make thermometers to measure temperature. Um, that rely on thermal expansion, which is a property of matter. Um, and if we, if we recall, when we talk about heat, what we're actually talking about is molecular motion. 
right? In, in a solid, the molecules are vibrating. In a liquid, they're zooming around. Um, and um, as we add heat, the molecules zoom around more, or they vibrate more, and the space between them increases. So the substance that we put the heat into ends up expanding. And it's such a strong effect that for very large structures, uh, that thermal expansion has to be accounted for in the design process, um, particularly when it's something like a bridge where, um, and now I'm not a bridge engineer, so don't, don't quote me on this, but um, if my calculations are correct, it's a very bad thing if the bridge is the wrong size. So if the bridge is built during the middle of the day and then at night it contracts and it's no longer long enough to be an effective bridge and one end of the bridge falls off, then what you have is not so much a bridge, but kind of a well-engineered cliff, which is not the best thing for driving across. Unless what you're really trying to do is drive to the bottom of the canyon as quickly as possible and in as, you know, and you're not really concerned about safety um, but then. But anyway, so we have to account for it. And um, it's convenient then that all the features will expand together and the hot uh, object will have the same proportions as the cold object. So we can end up um, designing for that and make things expand safely and contract and still be a bridge. Okay, I want to take a brief moment to talk about the direction of heat flow. We did mention these two words last time, I believe, endothermic, which is heat flowing into the system. So as in an endothermic uh, heat flow situation, um, the quantity of heat in the system ends up being greater than it absorbs heat, the heat goes up, absorbs heat, more heat, greater than zero. For an exothermic situation, we have heat leaving the system, out, heat out, heat out. Okay, so heat leaves the system, so the total heat in the system goes down, so that, that this is quantity of heat system, system quantity of heat is less than zero. And of course, um, the flow from the system or to the system, so it, where it comes from or where it goes, is the surroundings, surroundings. Um, so like, for example, um, when we melt uh, solid water, we add heat and it turns into a liquid uh, water. And that would be endothermic. Exothermic, we have to pull heat out and heat is released into the surroundings from the system and that would be freezing. And it doesn't have to be, of course, a beaker full of ice water or water or whatever. Um, it can be anything. It can be this, this orangish, reddish, pinkish box labeled system. There's our system. If it's endothermic, heat flows into the system. If it's exothermic, heat flows out of the system. So how do we measure the flow of heat or heat at all? Well, we use this device here. And I say we, I mean, you know, any kind of teaching lab, anywhere with any kind of thing, because um, we'll look at the alternative in a moment, and it's incredibly complicated and kind of expensive. And this one, this is like actually really pretty good. Like you can get really excellent results with this extraordinarily simple device. We have two styrofoam cups nested together, containing reactants in a solution. And Styrofoam is so good at insulating against heat loss or transfer um, that the amount of heat that's lost is going to end up being less than the margin of error on the thermometer in most cases. Like you have to have a really excellent thermometer to detect any kind of loss of heat or gain of heat from the surroundings into this. So this is a, a way to isolate a system from its surroundings. And let's see. So 
Um, then we have a glass stirring rod. So I, I know you're wondering, where does the heat go if it's not into the surround? There's air up here and we want to measure actually, um, we use this to measure like, um, did, did everyone, so when you made, when you made your soap, you had to dissolve sodium hydroxide in water, right? And if you were paying close attention, when you did that, you may have noticed that the water heated up, water heated up. And oh, I'm in the wrong corner. I'm gonna go off to this corner. There we go. Cat is going to move down a bit and now we have a coffee cup calorimeter. All right. Um, so, um, where was I? So, the water heated up when, uh, when you dissolve that sodium hydroxide. Now, suppose you wanted to um, come up with a specific, whoops, specific quantity of heat. Well, you might measure out how much sodium hydroxide you had, what mass you had, and then, you know, you might measure how much the temperature of, you'd, you'd measure the mass of the water and you'd measure how much temperature that water increased when you dissolved that sodium hydroxide in it. And now you'd have like some idea of how much heat you released by dissolving that water or that sodium hydroxide. Here's a cutaway view of that coffee cup calorimeter. Um, there's a stirring device so that you get complete reaction or dissolution. Um, there's a thermometer in our water. Uh, we know the volume or the mass of the water and we'll know and you put a styrofoam cover on it or just kind of any cover we just kind of want to isolate the the liquid inside from heat transfer from the outside so this is the complicated and expensive apparatus that um, most teaching labs at least won't use ever um, this is called a bomb calorimeter and this is the device that we use in order to find so suppose uh, we have our bag of rice here. We have our bag of rice, bag of rice, and we want to find, we want to verify that our serving size of 50 grams actually has 180 um, calories with a big C. And we'll talk in a moment about how that's different from calories with a small C. But what we'll do is we'll put our, we'll get one of these elaborate apparatuses, this bomb calorimeter, well, it has a steel bomb, which just means that it actually doesn't explode. We can explode things inside of it. It's made out of steel. We'll put our sample in that, in that, and we'll run an ignition wire through it, and we'll run a current through that wire. We can measure how much current, how much energy we put through that wire, and then uh, we'll basically set the rice on fire. And by basic mean, basically, I mean that's what we will actually do. We will burn that rice until no more rice will burn, until it won't burn anymore. And then we'll subtract the energy that we put into it and whatever else is left is the energy that the rice emitted when it burned. That uh, energy is gonna be heat, and so we're going to capture all that heat and push it into the water. It'll change the temperature of the water. The stirring device makes the whole thing um, kind of equilibrate. Um, so it becomes an even temperature and we'll measure the change in temperature. Since we know how much water we have and we know uh, some things about uh, this steel bomb, what we can then measure is the amount of energy that's released by burning this rice. There's another, just another picture of that, pretty much that exact thing. And that brings us to our common units of energy. Now I, I want to talk about the non-standard international unit, this number two here, and that's the calorie. That's calorie with a small c, calorie with a small c, and that's the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of water by one degree C, one gram of water, one degree C. And 
And that makes sense. That's, uh, that's sensible, right? So unfortunately, that's not, or fortunately, depending on how, what kind of measurements you're making, that's not the same unit that we use, that the standard international unit is. So the standard international unit is the joule, and that's going to be one kilogram times meter squared over a second squared. And so it's, it's a unit that's able to do work. That's what that whole derivation thing says, is this thing can do work. It's a unit of thing that can do work. Okay. And we also, we also talk about kilojoules, where one kilojoule is 1,000 joules, or 10 to the 3 joules. Um, and we can convert between these two through this conversion ratio. So one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules, or one joule is equal to 0 0.2390 calories. So the units of energy are the same regardless of the form of energy. So heat and electricity and light, any kind of energy can all be expressed using joules because energy is just a thing that can do work. Uh, that's, that's, what, that's what energy means actually is thing at work. N is like at and then erg is work. It's the thing at work. All right. So that was calories with a small c. It was calories with a small c. When we talk about calories with a big c, what we're actually talking about are kilocalories. So 1,000 calories with a small c is one calorie with a big c. So science uses small c calories. Food uses big c calories. So um, just keep in mind that that 50 grams of rice can increase the temperature of one gram of water by 180,000 degrees. <laughs> or it can, yeah, the other way, 180,000 grams of water by one degree. All right. So four big C calories equals 4,000 small C calories. And one small C calorie is 4.184 joules. And that's how we measure them using these calorimeters. So when we compare temperature with respect to heat, there are some differences and some similarities. Uh, so we measure temperature with a thermometer. Uh, we use a thermometer in the calorimeter, but the, we need that calorimeter in order to measure heat. What we're actually measuring with temperature is the average kinetic energy in a sample. And we measure it in Celsius or Kelvin. Celsius is spelled wrong here. Yay. Um, well, we measure, measure um, heat in joules or sometimes in calories. Heat, since we account for the mass of the substance, represents the total kinetic energy in a sample. And that makes kind of sense, right? Because like, suppose I have a coffee cup and it has 150 grams of coffee in it. And for our purposes, like we'll deal with coffee as though it were just water. Um, because in terms of heat, uh, they're pretty much the same. So I have 150 grams of coffee in my coffee cup. And if we uh, think wishfully and say that we have like 400 grams of coffee left in the, the French press, because maybe I hadn't already drunk all my coffee. Um, and if we say that they both are the same temperature, both the same temperature, which one has more heat? I mean, it's obvious that the one with the greater mass if they're the same, same substance, the one with the greater mass will have more heat. And that's because heat is a function of how much matter we have. 
So some similarities, they're both pertaining to the kinetic energy of matter. And they're both properties of matter. They're both properties. But temperature is an average, heat is the total. Heat cares about mass, temperature doesn't care about mass. So if we have equal masses of hot and cold water, um, ooh, story time. So I, uh, before I started this program, I worked for the kombucha brewery. And to make kombucha, you have to boil water and make tea. And then you end up with tea at like 90 degrees C. Then you add a bunch of sugar to the tea. Um, and then you have hot, sweet tea. And you add the sugar when it's hot because sugar dissolves better when it's hot. Now, when you're a kombucha brewery, you're making hundreds of liters of tea at a time. And a hundred plus, like 200 liters of water at 90 degrees C has a lot of thermal energy, a lot. And after you add that sugar, you have a certain amount of time, I think it's four hours, to cool it or use it and acidulate it. So like you have to get it to a temperature where the kombucha culture will be happy and you have to do it fast. It can't be too cold, so you can't just make it and then throw it in the fridge and then wait for it to heat up, hopefully, maybe. And it can't be too hot because it'll kill the kombucha. If it's too cold, you'll just get mold. The kombucha won't thrive and start. And if it's too hot, you'll kill it. And if it waits too long, then you can get other stuff coming in and growing like yeast and just the incidental stuff. So you want to be able to control the mass this like the temperature of this this thing. Now, if you just wheel it into the walk-in, eventually you'll just heat up the walk-in, and it won't. It, it takes a long time. Doesn't work. So how do you do it? Well, if we mix equal masses of hot and cold water, as we see, the hot water is moving really fast. Cold water is not moving so fast. The hot water will speed up the cold water, or the cold water, conversely, will slow down the hot water and we'll end up with water molecules in the same temperature. Which is to say, if you take cold water that you've kept in the walk-in and add it to your 90 degrees CT, you can lower that temperature to 50 degrees really fast. You just got to mix it. All right, specific heat. So this is the other thing that we need to talk about because like, and you, you know, you know, I know you know, I know you know what specific heat actually is and what it is and what it does. Because every, I'm pretty sure every one of you has been to a pizza restaurant sometime in your life. You've gone, you've had pizza, and the pizza comes out, they put it down on the table, and you go, you grab your slice, and the bread feels fine, but you put it in your mouth, and oh my goodness, it's like biting into a mouthful of bees that cheese and that pizza sauce are scaldingly hot. Um, it's like mouthful of bees hot and like, oh no. Um, but you know, your tongue's fine because your tongue just touched the, like the bread part, the, the crust. So why is that? So why, why? Like they they spent the same they came out of the oven at the same they're, it's all part of the same pie right came out of the oven at the same time and the answer has to do with specific heat which is the notion that different substances can hold different amounts of heat so different substances can can absorb more energy or gain like put up anyway. We'll talk, okay, so as this example says water and silver do not transfer heat equally well. In our example, um, the water is the, the cheese and the sauce and the crust is silver. Um, so water has a specific heat, a heat capacity, C is for capacity, of 4.184 joules divided by grams degrees C. What does that mean? And silver has a specific heat that's much lower than that. Much lower. 
So what does that mean? It means that it takes 4.184 joules of energy to heat one gram of water by one degree C. It also means that it only takes a much smaller number, 0 0.235 joules, to heat one gram of silver, one degree C. So um, a lot less energy to get the same change in the silver. So he, silver will gain and lose temperature much more easily than the water. So to think back to the pizza example, it's as though the crust were made of silver, which I, I, like the bougiest pizza joint I ever went to had anchovies and like goat's cheese as toppings. I don't know, they didn't have silver crusted pizza. And I time, I'm going to the wrong pizza joint. I don't know. Maybe it's the right pizza. I don't know. I was, I don't think I'd be able to afford a silver crusted pizza. I kind of want one though now for some reason. Maybe I just want pizza. Anyway, in our situation here, the silver is hot, the water is cold. Uh, that means the water will heat up slowly and require a lot of energy, while the silver will cool off quickly and not release as much energy. Just like when the pizza came out of the oven, the crust cooled down quickly. By the time it got to the table, you could hold it comfortably, but that cheese and that sauce had a higher specific heat. They held onto their energy longer, and when you tried to... Um, Tried to bite the pizza, the pizza bit back. All right, and it just says, let's look at the math. We'll do that later. Uh, let's look at some specific heats of some substances. Uh, we have water up at the top. Water has a really kind of high specific heat. This is liquid water, liquid water. I want to make that clear. Um, so 4.18 joules per gram degrees Celsius. So um, this is the amount of heat it takes each of these to increase one gram of the substance by one degree C. And keep in mind, so like aluminum has a higher heat capacity than iron. So iron will gain and lose heat faster than aluminum, but aluminum is less dense than iron. So you're generally dealing with less mass. So just keep that in mind, that mass matters when it comes to this, like, how much energy a thing is releasing at a given moment. So if I have an aluminum pan in the oven and an iron pan in the oven, and I pull them both out at the same time, the iron loses heat faster, but only relative to its mass. So the iron pan is more likely to be much more massive. So the end result would be that I'll probably be able to touch the aluminum pan fast sooner than I will be able to like just grab the iron pan. Um, the water or the sauce or whatever in both pans is still going to be scaldingly hot though. So, yep. All right. How do we determine this? Well, we compare it by heating something up and then finding out how much heat it transfers to water. Um, I actually did this in eighth grade. It was kind of fun. So, um, remember that I pointed out that that was liquid water? So this is, this is the heat capacity for ice, the specific heat of ice, and it's different. It's 2.077 joules per gram degrees centigrade. So it takes 2.077 degrees to increase the temperature of ice by one degree C, which means the slope of this, oh, uh, uh, I don't know why it says time, that should be heat. So it takes less heat to increase the temperature, so the slope will be different. Um, that should say that should say heat, not time. Um, anyway, um, ten grams of ice, twenty point seven seven. Anyway, so 
heat is equal to the mass of a sample times the specific heat times the change in temperature, which we write like this. Q equals M times C sub P times delta T, or Q equals M cat, because that kind of looks like an A, it's not an A, but I want to I want to keep um, my, it, it says cat, we like cats. All right, I'm going to copy and paste that. I'm going to move my, copy and paste that, and we'll move on to Copy. All right, we'll move on to some notes. And I'm gonna, there we are. I'm gonna adjust my, there we are. We are period six. Whew, it's a long time ago. Um, page template, math science notes. This is quantities of heat. formulas and theorems. There's this one. This one here, Q equals M C delta T. Uh, we'll also talk about, we'll, we'll, we'll mention that delta T equals T the final temperature T sub final minus T initial and I'll write I'll write this larger in a minute all right and I think is there something else oh yeah C sub P, the specific heat capacity, is in units of joules divided by grams times degrees C. Where is it? Insert symbol. Degrees C. There it is. All right. Homework is going to be the quantities of heat um, PDF. Quantities of heat. And for some reason, I can't type quantities. I can write it just fine, but I always, like, the I and the T get messed around. Okay. So, let's write some annotations here. Q. This stands for quantity of heat. And it's going to be in joules. Mass is M. M is mass. Oh, my. I need to. I need to do something. I need to close some tabs. Get rid of some background process in hopefully that was enough okay quantity of heat m is mass in grams 
C sub P is specific heat capacity. And that's going to be in units of joules over grams degrees C, grams times degrees C. And delta T is change in temperature. in degrees C. Can also be in Kelvin, doesn't really matter, but we'll list most of our stuff in degrees C. Um, and I wanna write this bigger, delta T, change in temperature, is equal to T final, the ending temperature, <laughs> final, final has an A and not an E, Final T final minus T initial. T final minus T initial is delta T. All right, so if we, if we substitute in all our units, we end up with joules equals grams times joules over grams times degrees C times degrees C. But if we resolve this, like we end up with joules equals joules, and this is not the tautology club, um, and you all know the first rule of tautology club, which is the first rule of tautology club. <clears throat> so, um, what else? I think that's it. Oh, uh, the specific heat of water. Is going to be four point. Oops. Four point one eight four. Joules per grams degrees C. All right. And with that, we'll get on to some guided practice. All right. I am. So we'll start with the first one from our problem set. How many joules are needed to change 40.0 grams of water? Come back. There we are. We'll paste that in here. 40.0 grams of water from 10 degrees C, 10.0 degrees C, to 30.0 degrees C. Make that larger. All right. So remember, Q is equal to cat M C delta T. So we know our mass in grams, and we can find delta T. Delta T is T final minus T initial. Delta T equals T final, 30 degrees C, 30.0 degrees C, 30.0. Degrees C minus T initial, 10.0 degrees C. 
Okay, which is 20.0 degrees C. So we want to know how many joules are needed. So what's our Q? Uh, Q is Q is joules, right? So Q is joules, right? This goes to that right there. Q is joules. How many joules are needed? We have we know our mass. We have 40.0 grams of water. H2O. We know our specific heat. We know C, that's C sub P. <clears throat> we know our specific heat. It's going to be liquid water because it's above zero C. That's going to be 4.184 joules for every gram degree C. Okay, and we know our delta T now, because we just found our delta T. Delta T is going to be 20 degrees C, 20.0 degrees C. So degrees C will cancel. Uh, grams of H2O will cancel. I neglected to write H2O here. How shameful. Yep. And now we're left with quantity that we can plug into a calculator. I'm just going to rewrite that Q to make it a little more clear as a Q. Q. There we go. And what we end up with, oh, whatever, 40 times 4.184 times 20 is 337, sorry, 3347 Three, three, four, seven point two joules. Now that's not in scientific notation, so I can do kind of one of two things. I want to make it scientific notation. I also want to resolve our significant digits. We have three significant digits this whole time, so we'll round it to the third decimal place. And I'm frozen on your screen. Um, thanks for the heads up. I, I'm wondering if it... Let me see. Am I frozen on my screen in Zoom? Can you still see the presentation? Am I still sharing my screen? I'm not sharing my screen. Did I not share my screen? Screen is just lagging. Okay. All right. I was too preoccupied with recording. Um, all right. So uh, expressed in scientific notation, we can move the decimal over to here, round it to the third place, 3.35 times 10 to the third times 10 to the three joules. That's how many joules. We can also write it as kilojoules, 3.35 kilojoules, which is 3.35 kilojoules, small k, big J, small k, big J, kilojoules. Um, incidentally, when you write pH, when you write pH, it's small p, big H. Small p, big H means negative log of the concentration of H plus. That's pH. If you write big P small h, big P small h is um, big P small h. That's, um, as far as I can tell, that's, that's the abbreviation for the Philippines. Abbreviation for the Philippines. Um, so small p, big h, negative log concentration of H plus. 
And I, I can I can tell which one you mean by from the context. It's just I want to I, I want I want to, I just I'll, I'll just point it out. I'll point it out. All right. Let's look at another example. Let's look at another example. And let's look at this one. If 4,400 joules are added to a 15 gram sample of water at 20 C, what will its final temperature be? All right. There we go. Make that larger. What will its final temperature be? Okay. So, so let's go. So uh, we're looking. Use the same equation, Q equals mass times specific heat times delta T times change in temperature. What will its final temperature be? Okay, so delta T is T final minus T initial. We know our we know our t initial, so we, we want to solve for t final. So if we add t initial to both sides, so delta t plus t initial is going to be our t final. T final. Ah. There we are. T final. So now we just need to solve this for delta T. All right, so we have 4,400 joules. And we have 15 grams of water. And we know the specific heat of water is 4.184. Uh, joules over grams times degree C. Okay. Times delta T. All right. We want to solve for delta T. I'm going to cancel my grams of water here. Um, I'm going to multiply both sides by degrees C. I know delta T is actually, it's going to be in degrees C, but I want to cancel both of these. So degrees C And then I'm going to multiply both sides. I'm going to divide both sides by 15 times 4.184 times joules. Okay. Divide by 15 times 4.184 joules. Okay. And now our joules will cancel. And if we are careful with how we piece this together in the calculator, we should be left with, I did the same thing over here. 15 times 
4.184 joules. Cancel that whole thing with that and that. And what we're left with is delta T. All right. In degrees C over here. Okay, so I'll take 4,400. And I'll divide it by the product of, so I'll use the parentheses on my calculator, product of 15 times 4.184. Close parentheses. All right. And that gives me 70.108. 70.108 degrees C is our delta T. Now we only have two significant digits here, so let's round it to two significant digits. Rounding to two, and we have 70 degrees C as our delta T. So delta T is 70, 70 degrees C, plus T initial is 20 degrees C, is our final temperature. So final temperature, 90 degrees C. Ta-da! Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today, I think. Wait, no, 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 no. We're here until 1240, aren't we? Yes, we are. Oh, okay. Okay, I always get that wrong. There's another class that ends at 1225. We have enough time for another example. What luck. All right. Let's look at number two. Are there any questions so far? Any questions? Everyone following along? Has everyone fallen asleep? Party trumpets in the Zoom session if you have fallen asleep. computer is like struggling for some reason. Paste. There it is. Okay. A 135 gram sample of water is cooled. 85 to 23 C. How much heat is involved? Is it heat absorbed or heat released? Okay. First of all, what do you guys, what do you all think? How about that second part? Is this heat going to be absorbed or released? Please answer in the chat. And when you answer in the chat, please chat to everyone, not just to me. Water is cooling from 85C to 23C. How much heat is involved? What I'm asking is, will the heat be absorbed or released?
in the interest of maintaining the video quality, I'm just I'm going to start writing things. Um, so remember, I have a released question mark, um, and let's let's talk about this. All right. So remember quantity of heat, and this 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 refers to the quantity of heat of the system of the system and it's like after this kind of reaction I guess takes place um, or it's after this thing happens this transfer of energy so the quantity of heat is equal to the mass of the sample times the specific heat of the sample times the change in temperature change in temperature Remember, our change in temperature is equal to the final temperature It's really hard when my drawing tablet is not responsive. Delta T is equal to T final minus T initial. So what we're given our delta t here, what is our delta t? What's our t final? What's our t final? Cooled from eight, okay, we started eight, so our t initial 85, our t final is 23 degrees C. 23 degrees C minus our t initial. 85 degrees C for a sum of negative 62 degrees C. Negative 62 degrees C. So our delta T is negative 62 degrees. We want to know how much heat is involved. So delta T is negative. What's that going to do to our quantity of heat? I'll give you a hint. We can't have a negative mass. We also can't really have a negative specific heat. So what do we get when we multiply a positive thing and a positive thing and a negative thing? If you're thinking we get a negative value on this side, you'd be correct. So here's how this is going to go. We have 145 grams of water. And we have our specific heat of water, 4.184 joules for every gram of water times degree C. Times our negative 62 degrees C change in temperature. Degree C cancels, grams of water cancels. We're left with a quantity of heat that's 145, 145 times 4.184 times negative, I'm using that negative button on the calculator again, the one in the parentheses. It's different than the minus sign. times negative 62 gives me negative 37,614.16. I'm going to write that. Negative 37614.16. Okay, my drawing tablet is responding again. 
That's interesting. And that's in what units left? It's joules. Joules. This is not scientific notation. I can rewrite it as scientific notation. Negative 3.76. How many? We have two significant digits. So I'm going to round to the second significant digit. Negative 3.8 times 10 to the minus, what is it? Or 10 to the, wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, times 10 to the 4 joules. And it's negative. It's negative. So since it's so since heat is flowing out of the system because water is cooling, heat is flowing out of the system, the ending point, the T final, the end point of the system has less energy than the starting point. The only way for that to happen is, of course, for heat to be released into the surroundings. So, a couple of takeaways. Cooling releases heat. We had a special name for this when, when heat's released. Does anyone remember that name? Heat's released. Give you a hint. Starts with an E and ends with exothermic. Exothermic. These are exothermic conditions. When water is cooled down, releasing heat into the surroundings. Heat flows out of the system in order to cool it down. Okay. So, if a thing has a negative energy value for its quantity of heat, that means it is exothermic. It is releasing heat. Negative value, negative Q is exothermic. Okay. And we have about five minutes remaining in class. I'm going to, I think I'm going to end it there um, because this is as far as we got in the other classes. Um, now let me stop recording or I can change over to my cat camera. Cat camera. So uh, that's all we have for today. Um, the, the problem set will be due on uh, in the next class period, and um, that's it. I think it's the weekend for you guys, in, uh, as far as our class is concerned. So, uh, 